at least give you something to, uh, to color on. The Bible and geology. Isn't that, doesn't that sound intriguing? What in the world is geology? Rocks. All right. We're going to study. Did you bring your rocks with you today? The Bible and rocks. The study of geology is the study of looking at the history of the earth. Uh, and the earth, of course, is made up of rocks. So we're going to be talking about rocks this morning. It's the study of the history of the earth and, uh, and the remains of the plants and the animals that we go in and we investigate and look at their composition, the forces that have acted upon them. And of course, as we go through uh, the study of geology, and if you pick up any geology textbook, geolo- or, uh, scientists, evolutionists, believe that this is their, one of their strongest points in the proof of evolution. They think when it comes to geology and you study fossils, you study the rocks and all of that, they think this is one of their greatest uh, allies in the defense of evolution. Well, I want us this morning, and it says part one on your handout, because we're going to look at this next week too. There's too much to talk about here. I, uh, in order to better understand geology, I read, read, a, uh, read a book about it this week, because geology to me is just a huge topic that a lot of people say a lot of things about. How does it fit? And the question this morning is, where are the facts? And where do the facts point? Do the facts from geology point towards a creator and point towards the biblical record, or do the facts and the results that we have from biology point toward what evolutionists want us to believe, that the world is the result of a big bang and uh, of uh, eons and eons of time? And so when you look at, when you look at these two views, the the origin of the earth, the history of the earth, basically there's two vantage points. One is what's called uniformitarianism. We're going to have a spelling test after a class today, so uh, get these right. Uniformitarianism. This is the evolutionist viewpoint, which basically says that everything has remained uniform and nothing, there's just been gradual changes over time. That's what uniformitarianism is, is that nothing really major, it's just been gradual changes and everything's kind of stayed the same. Then you've got... uh, you would almost think that these words are uh, reversed. Uh, But then you've got uh, catastrophism. Don't you like that word? Sounds like when you had little kids in the house, right? It was catastrophism uh, when you had the kids in the house. That's that's the biblical viewpoint. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute and explain why it's called catastrophism. You would think that would be the evolution standpoint. But evolutionists say everything's uniform. There's just been gradual changes and and so gradual that they say they're imperceptible. You really can't see them. Uh, Of course, that's what they say when you're looking at geology, is that uh, everything is uniform. When you go and look at biology, they say all things are so much different than they used to be. So are they different or are they the same? It's like they want it to go both ways. They They want to have it both ways, whatever they're looking at. Now, catastrophism. Can you think of any catastrophe that happened in the Bible? Any worldwide catastrophes that impacted everything on this globe? Can we say Noah and the flood? It's interesting, and we're not talking about it this morning, but it's interesting how some over time have tried to make that some kind of a localized flood. That it just happened in that little region where Noah lived, but it wasn't global. And it's not our intent to talk about that this morning, but there's no evidence for it being local. There is an abundance of evidence for it being worldwide. When the flood came upon this earth, were there violent changes that took place to the the very earth? Look in, uh, you got your Bibles, look in 2 Peter chapter 3, just to see this, this terminology um, that, that's, a, that's interesting. Uh, let's see if we, hopefully we can find the verse. Second Peter chapter 3, 
Uh, you know that uh, Peter, in 1 Peter and 2 Peter, uh, both of these books, he talks about the flood, talks about Noah, and references Noah and the flood. He did so in 2 Peter chapter 2. Look in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. 2 Peter 3, verse 5. For this they, these false teachers, who, these mockers, uh, people who were mocking, saying, where's Jesus? For this they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water. God, by his very word, in the beginning spoke, and there was everything was created. The heavens were of old, and the earth and the water. By which, verse 6, the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. What does that mean? Does that mean that the earth was annihilated? Does that mean that the earth ceased to exist? No, it doesn't say that it ceased to exist, but it says that the world that then was, past tense, was the world before the flood different than the world after the flood? Very much so. Is it a catastrophe? Is there, evi is there evidence for catastrophism or is there evidence for just all gradual uniformitarianism change? Where does the evidence point? And that's what we want to look at as we go through this, uh, as we go through this study. Who knows what the geologic, some people call it the geologic uh, column. Uh, some textbooks call it the geologic timetable. Who knows what that is? You ever seen one of those? Dirk, you know what that is? Where they, they try to show... And we're, we're gonna, I'm going to show you one in just a minute. Where they try to show with this geologic timetable their idea of how we have evolved. How life has evolved on the face of the earth. Evolutionists claim that the, that the earth is four and a half to five billion years old. I dare say that probably when some of you were in school that the number was not that big probably smaller than that. It, it's growing. Not sure why. I mean, if, it's, if it is what it is, why does the number keep growing? They claim that they're, you know, and why do they say four and a half to five? You know, why don't they say 10 to 12? Why don't they say 40 to 50? I mean, if we're going back billions of years, at some point the number doesn't matter, right? I mean, when we start talking about a trillion dollars in this, in this nation, at some point, that number just gets so big that it's like, okay, <laughs> whatever. You know, to, to you, what's the difference to you between 200 billion, 500 billion, and a trillion? Does, I mean, I'm not trying to make little of our economic situation in our, in our country, but to the average person, whether I'm two billion, two hundred billion, or two billion for that matter, two billion, two hundred billion, or two trillion dollars in debt, you know what? It doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, I, I could be any of those, and it wouldn't matter. So it's interesting that they keep changing this. But then they say life has not always existed. The Earth might be that old, but life has not always existed on the Earth. In fact, uh, life has only been around for maybe the past two billion years, and that's not human life, by the way. That's life forms in general. Bill? What we say in the accounting field, we start talking like that, we say it's only zeros. <laughs> yeah. From an accountant, he says it's only zeros. Yeah, I mean, what's a zero? It's not worth anything, right? Uh, it's only zeros. Here they say that life has only existed for about two billion years. That's not human life. Because what they say is that life began with the very simple and has evolved into the increasingly complex. You and I are increasingly complex. Did you know that? Men know that. When we look at women, we think increasingly complex, right? So we have evolved from single-cell males, right? That's us. Into multifaceted complex females. Is that, is that what this is saying? They are saying that we started off very simple. And now we have evolved into creatures that are very complex. When your children go to school, they are going to see 
in their biology textbooks or in their geology. I don't, I don't guess they teach geology uh, in uh, school unless you're a specialized study. But they are going to see these charts. They're going to see the geological column, the geologic uh, uh, timetable. And what they're trying to do with that timetable is to try, and I underscore the word try, try to show 12 different geological ages. And so they, they represent them by the fossils, and we'll look at those index fossils, and they supposedly, this column shows, the development of living organisms over vast eons of time. So from the Encyclopedia Britannica, here's what a geologic column looks like. We're going to look at it from the bottom to the top. They start off with this Precambrian uh, pre era that they say is about 550 to 650 or more bil uh, billion years. No, million years, sorry. You know, billion, trillion, zillion. I mean, it's all the same, right? So they say here's 550 million to 650 million years ago when the first animal traces, first soft-bodied uh, metazoans, first skeletal elements began to creep into existence. It's a long time ago, right? And so then you just work up, and they say, then there was the first fishes, and then there was the first vascular land plants, and then there were the first amphibians, and you go up, uh, notice that we're progressing hundreds of millions of years. You get into uh, these first amphibians, and then you, you come in and you find the first reptiles. You're getting closer to, to man. Do you recognize that? We've gone from single cell things, now we're up to fish and we're reptiles. This is looking like your husband, right? We're, we're getting closer and closer. You see the progression, don't you? That we're getting closer, don't you think? I mean, because now we at least have feet. Uh, th these dudes down here didn't have feet. So we're obviously progressing. Things are going from the simple uh, to the complex. Uh, we've got the, rep the, reptiles, the reptiles who are, are growing more diverse. Uh, you've got the first dinosaurs. You see these words? Jurassic. You ever heard that word before? You thought they made that up, right? You thought Hollywood came up with, uh, came up with this idea. You've got the first dinosaurs, first mammals, 200 million years ago. That's what they say, is when those came into existence. Birds come, and then you have the first flowering plants, the first primates. That's your ancestors, by the way, is what they say. The dinosaurs became extinct. The first mammal, or the mammals begin to diversify. And then somewhere in the last two million years, remember, life has existed on the earth in some form for two billion years. But human life has only been known to this earth for about two million years. Your children pick up their textbooks, and this is not taught as anything other than fact. Novell? Does it show what they ate? The what, what the dinosaurs ate? Well, it, it, that's, that's a good point. Here's first flowering plants after the dinosaurs. Well, here's the extinction of dinosaurs. Maybe they, who knows? Some of them were, you know, some of them were vegetarian. Some of them uh, uh, were, uh, uh, they were more meat eaters. Um, it's interesting to look at their chart. It's interesting to look at their time frame and how they, how they see things happening. But here's what I want to, here's what, if you don't, if you don't get anything else this morning, here's what I want you to understand. Is this is what they say supposedly furnishes the proof for evolution. What has happened is they have gone on these archaeological, geological digs, maybe is a better word than archaeological, geological digs, they have found fossils. They have, they have assigned these fossils to certain levels on the geologic timetable. They find a fossil uh, of, a, of a mammal, they find a fossil of whatever, and these become their index fossils. So any other fossil that happens to be like that fossil automatically fits into that level. Okay? So what, what does that mean? What that means is that they believe that evolution is so real and factual that when they find fossils 
they interpret the fossils. When they find fossils, they look at the rock in which that fossil was found. They interpret the fossil and they interpret the rock by their evolutionary mindset. What are we saying? They're, they already have preconceived ideas. They already are biased in a certain direction. They already believe, look, notice this guy says, this paleontologist says, owing to the irreversibility of evolution. Evolution is true. You can't reverse it. You can't change it. They believe that evolution is true. And so they've created this chart, but it's only based on subjective assumptions. There is no actual truth. Seriously. There, and I'm going to show this as we go through today and next week. There is no actual truth to the geologic timetable. They have made assumptions. They have taken these fossils and they say, well, here's the dinosaurs. We found dinosaurs fossils. So they have to fit. The dinosaur fossils have to fit in the Jurassic period. Where did they come up with that? They made it up. If they find a fossil from, from a fish, or they find a fossil from an amphibian, or they find a fossil from a reptile, they, they assign it to this time period, they assign it to this level in this time period. Why? Is there evidence for that? No. There's no evidence to do that. But their mindset is, we are going to take these findings, and we are going to fit them into our belief. It's a little bit backwards, isn't it? Isn't that like taking what you want the Bible to say and coming to the Bible and forcing it into the Bible to make the Bible say what you want it to say? Is that, is that, is that good hermeneutics? Is that a good way to study the Bible and interpret the Bible is to take what you want it to say, take what you believe, and force it on the Bible? That's not, that's not honest study. That's a study that says, I want to find what I want to find. Hello, that's exactly what they're doing. They have created their own belief system. If you don't, if you don't already think it, evolution is a religion that they have created. And so everything they find, a rock, a fossil, it has to conform to their evolutionary standards. It has to fit. No matter what the facts might be, no matter what the evidence might really prove, they've got a certain notion, and everything about it is going to fit into their geologic timetable. Let me see if I can give you a, an illustration to show you what they're doing um, and, and to help us to see how silly what they're doing really is. Suppose I were to tell you that we have a member of this church who was born into royalty. Anybody, anybody in here? Uh, we have a member of this church who was born into royalty. He was one of the founding members of the Harlem Globetrotters. That's impressive. Wouldn't you like to meet him? He was born into royalty, founding member of the Harlem Globetrotters. He invented the cell phone. Brilliant guy. He invented the cell phone. This member of Palm Beach Lakes stands at six feet, nine inches tall. You know it's not me, right? I'm not there yet. I'm trying. This member of Palm Beach Lakes is a 37-year-old millionaire. Okay, we're narrowing, we're narrowing it down, right? Are you getting an idea of who we're talking about? Okay, born into royalty. Founding Globetrotter, invented the cell phone, six foot nine, 37 year old millionaire, and he's a faithful Christian. You know who I'm talking about? Maybe this will help you. <laughs> so, what do you think, Mike? Um, is, is it, is this true? Uh, G, if only, Gene, is this true? You know, G, Mike, where, where did you live before you came?
to Florida. Didn't you come from New York? New York. Where did the Globetrotters come from? <laughs> Hello? Mike, what, 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 what line of work were you in? Where, you worked for the phone company. You worked for the phone company, didn't you? He invented the cell phone. Didn't you just hear the man? <laughs> Is that honest? Is Mike a faithful Christian? Oh, I got one thing right. There was one fact involved there. Everything else was manipulated to fit what I wanted Mike to be. Mike, don't you want to be a 37-year-old millionaire? No, thanks. Okay. <laughs> you can manipulate facts. And if you didn't know Mike, so if you're visiting here today and you don't know Mike, this could be true until he stands up and you realize he's not six foot nine. Uh, you know, this could be true. We could lead you to believe that this was the case. <clears throat> Folks, that's what we're doing with our kids. They lay out this chart. This is more impressive than this, by the way. They lay out this chart. This is impressive. They've got dates on it. Man, if you can put a date on something, that makes it authentic, right? They've got pictures. Hello? They've got pictures of all of these things evolving. They know exactly when it happened. And that's what they're teaching our children. You know what the Bible says? You think the Bible would go along with any of this, of the evolutionary uh, geologic timetable? You think the Bible fits with that? What does the Bible say about creation? You look at the Bible and the Bible says that the earth was created in six literal days. Evolutionists want eons of time for these things to evolve and to come into existence. But the Bible will not allow that. The Bible says this happened in six literal days. The Bible says that when man was created, that the earth was created in order that it might be inhabited by man. That was the purpose. God made the earth to be inhabited. Well, evolutionists want you to believe that the earth existed for at least two and a half billion years without any kind of inhabitants. Well, that doesn't make any sense. The Bible says that man was created in order to subdue and exercise dominion over the earth, over the creation, over the animals. He was to have uh, authority and dominion over the animals. But what about all of those animals that existed before man ever came on the scene? What about all of those dinosaurs who went extinct and we never had the opportunity to have dominion over them? But the Bible says that's what man was supposed to do. He was supposed to have dominion. But how does that work with those animals who were here before man ever came on the scene? You can see that, that the testimony of Scripture and the testimony of our evolution is obviously, you know that those two cannot match. That they cannot go together. Here's the is wanting eons of time. Notice what this man says in his book, The Origin of Life. Given so much time, if you, have eon, if you have billions of time, billions of years of time, notice what he says happens. The impossible becomes possible. The possible becomes probable. The probable becomes virtually certain. One only has to wait. Time performs the miracle. What does that tell you? Is there any evidence? Any proof for this? No. But if we, if we can inject billions of years, then that time will take care of itself. How do you, how do you not know they're going to say to you, how do you not know that this didn't happen four billion years ago? To them, it's impossible. You might think it's impossible, but couldn't it be possible? And if it could be possible, then why wouldn't it be probable? Why wouldn't it be likely? And if it was likely, then, I mean, it's just a given fact that this is the way that it was. This is how the whole idea of evolution has gone from an idea in the mind of Charles Darwin to be put in our children's textbooks as not even just a theory of evolution, 
but as a fact. And if you believe anything else, if you believe that the world might have been created by God, you're a pretty small-minded individual. You haven't seen the big picture. You haven't seen all of the evidence that's there. Yeah, the, the time he could be talking about is, 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 as Scott says, the indoctrination of our children. When they hear it year after year after year, you know, I've been talking to my girls about this since I don't remember when, how young they were. Why do we teach our children about creation? Why do we teach them about God? And why do we teach them over and over and over and over again? Because they're being indoctrinated on the other side. And if that would seem silly... Initially, can as this man says, the impossible ultimately becomes certain. Here's why, as I mentioned before, the age of the earth is approximately doubled every 20 years. Why? Because they, if they can just keep making it bigger, then it just seems more certain. And there's perhaps less that we're able to argue about it. Jesus said that man existed from the beginning of creation. Man was right there at the beginning of creation. What day was man created on? Sixth day. Man was there from the beginning of creation. How can it fit that he didn't come along until millions or billions of years later? Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 says that the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. God says that His power and His deity have been perceived and observed by mankind. But according to evolutionists, that's not true except for the last couple million years that we weren't here to see it from the beginning. And those two things don't fit. Here's what we've got to remember. We've got to remember that this timetable does not exist anywhere except on paper. I want, you to, I want you to hear that. Except on a piece of paper. And I could take that photo of Mike that we had and print it out on a piece of paper. And I would have just as much evidence on that piece of paper as your children have for the geologic timetable on the piece of paper in their textbook. Both of them have the same amount. And we're gonna, I'm, I'm speaking in, 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 uh, in general terms. I, I'm going to get specific and to prove all of this, but I want us to understand this at the beginning. Dave? Uh, one of the first words you use when you talk about experience and It's, as Dave mentions, mentions an example where, uh, you know, the, the presupposition is that this was millions or billions of years old, and then they find data, they find evidence, and, oh, we've got to adjust that number to be more, perhaps more reasonable to show that maybe there was really some life here in more recent times. Um, when God created the earth, did he create, when he created man, did he create man full grown? When he created the flowers, did he create them full grown? When he created trees, when God created trees, were, were, were they this tall? You know, when, when, when he said, don't eat of that tree, 
you know, where, where Adam and Eve thinking, well, eat of it. I better not step on it. You know, I might kill it. I mean, a tree is a tree, right? These things are full grown. That's the way God created the earth was in a mature state. You think that's throwing evolutionists off? You know, here's God, and in six days, boom, an earth comes into existence in a mature state. It doesn't fit evolution, because evolutionists want to see this gradually coming into existence, and so obviously those two things are not going to work. Here's what some of these evolutionists, here's what some of these scientists say about the geologic table. They say it should be understood that it is not possible to proceed directly downward through this bed of rocks. It's not possible to go all the way down and to see all of these things happen. There is no place on this earth where you can see all of these levels together. I want you to hear that. There's no place on this earth where you can, you can dig and you find human fossils. And then you dig a little bit more and you get into the, uh, the tertiary area and you find some mammal fossils. And you dig a little bit more. There's no place on this earth where you dig down and you gradually find each of these fossils in succession. That place does not exist. So that's what this guy's saying. He's admitting it's not possible for us to go down through this because there's no place like it that exists. He says, the full strata is made, out of, uh, made only by putting together this data that's gathered from throughout the earth. And even when this is done, an, absolute, an absolutely complete series cannot yet be made out. So here, here in this country, they find a fossil of a human. Here in this country, they find a fossil of a mammal. Here in this country, they find a fossil of an amphibian. Here in, this, here in this country, they find a fossil of a fish. And what they do is they just start stacking them up. And they're stacking them up based upon their chart. They've already made out this chart. And so everything's going to fit into it. And so here's a fish. And so the fish, the fish fits into wherever the fish is. The first fish on the... Uh, the Solarian, uh, the uh, Cambrian areas, that's, okay, he's a fish, so he fits in here. And, and the amphibian, he fits in here. And the mammal, he fits in here. And the human, he fits in here. And so then they say these layers, they just go on top of each other, or they go underneath each other. But notice what this guy says. We really can't figure out the complete series yet. It can't, then, then how do we have this? How do we have a chart that's showing us everything that's happened in the last 500 million years if we cannot figure out a complete series yet. Does that make sense? Suppose you use that same logic with the IRS. You know, here, here's my figures for this year. It's not a complete series for this year. There's some holes and there's some gaps, but it's, it's pretty close. Is that going to fly? What if you tried that with your boss? Well, here's the project you wanted me to do. It's not a complete series because that cannot be done yet. Folks, how does that work? These are, the scientists are supposed to be the most brilliant people on the face of the earth, right? We hold them up in high esteem that, oh, these are the scientists and these are the science textbooks. And wow, this is so powerful. And yet they even admit, uh, well, you know, this, this isn't, it gets even better. It gets even better. Here's an evolutionist who sees gaps, and we're going to talk about some of these gaps in a minute that exist, and he says, the record is by no means complete. Boy, they sure make it look complete, don't they? The record is by no means complete. There are great gaps covering millions of years in which absolutely no records have been found. Except they create a chart, stick it in a textbook, and says this is the way it was, but then somewhere else they say, oh, but these records really don't exist. Then where did this come from? How do we have a timetable that shows the evolution of life when there's no evidence? Folks, that's not honest. How, 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 can, how can anyone honestly believe this when there is no evidence? People want you, pe people ask you the same thing about believing in God. How can you believe in God when there is no evidence? How can you believe in creation when there is no evidence? Folks, don't, don't even let them have that ground. Is there evidence for creation? 
Open your eyes. Is there evidence for God? Look around. It's all over. Is there evidence for evolution? I don't think so. Look at what this guy says. No more than 1% or so of the history of the earth is decipherable. <laughs> They've got a whole chart for 600 million years, but oh, but no more than 1% is decipherable. But that 1% is dispersed through a series of events or episodes extending back through geologic time. Look at what he says. By imaginative manipulation of the evolving data, we can construct a magnificent and awesome history of the earth and its life. Where did this chart come from? By imaginative manipulation. That's what your kids did to you. Imaginative manipulation. They twisted and turned the facts to try to make you believe something that really wasn't true. Huh. That's what evolutionists are doing. Twisting and turning the facts to try to get you to believe something that is really not true. And strikingly enough, there are some who are even willing to admit it. Very quickly, I want you to see some of what we need to recognize as some missing strata. Remember, this does not exist anywhere. They even admit it. And in fact, these layers can't be found together in many places. The Grand Canyon is, is their granddaddy of all places. They think, they, the Grand Canyon, they think, is one of their greatest proofs of evolution. They think it shows one billion years of life. But when you go and look at, at the Grand Canyon, you've got a huge gap here of about two million, 200 million years that's nowhere in the Grand Canyon. I mean, if the Grand Canyon is the granddaddy of all of them, wouldn't you think you could dig down and maybe not even have to dig down? You could just walk up to a wall of the Grand Canyon and see this picture. Wouldn't you think you could see that picture in the Grand Canyon? But even in the Grand Canyon, there's 200 million years. It's not there. They've got these layers. They've got these layers. But this layer is, so that means this layer must be sitting on top of this layer. Oh, wait a minute. It's not supposed to do that. It's not supposed. This layer is not supposed to sit on top of here because there's supposed to be something in between. Up in Canada, this was a while back, but up in Canada, in Banff. Anybody ever been to Banff? Uh, been there. Pretty nice city. Up in Banff, here, here's what the the uh, a, uh, the government of Canada admitted about the findings up there, east of the main divide of the Rocky Mountains, the Lower Carboniferous. Remember, we're having a spelling test in just a minute. The lower Carboniferous is overlaid in places by the Cretaceous. Wait a minute. What happened to this right here? It's not there. Look at what he says. They differ so widely in respect to age, but one overlies the other without a perceptible break. It just looks like it's just one piece. Huh. I wonder why it just looks like it's one piece. They go on and say that this separation of the one from the other is rendered more difficult. Well, I didn't think it was difficult to begin with. It's more difficult because the Carboniferous almost precisely looks like the Cretaceous. Well, no kidding. One sitting on top of another, and so they say, were it not for the fossil evidence, were it not for our chart that we made up with no evidence at all, one would naturally suppose that we're looking at one single solitary level. Hello? How does that happen? Jerry? David, that's what I was going to say earlier. There's only a couple of instances on that chart that you can't find every one of those items in existence today. Yeah. It, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it, it's amazing. Here, here we've got another gap. We've got 150 million years gone. Poof. Where, what happened to it? How can that 150 million years not be in existence in that area? What does the evidence show? The evidence shows that it was laid down in the same approximate time era. That's what the evidence shows. That's what they admitted. But what they also admitted is that because of the fossils, remember these are the index fossils. If they find a fossil of, of a reptile, they stick it in this level. If they find a fossil of a primate, they stick it in this level so they say, oh, well, these levels just aren't there. And so they interpret 
all of their findings strictly and only by their presuppositions. We didn't get to what I wanted to get to today. But next week, next week we're going to look at some of these, not just there being gaps in between them, but some of these levels being flip-flopped, where they're in the wrong order. And how do you figure that out? We'll finish, hopefully finish our study of geology next week.